In this breakout session, we are going to be talking about stem cell research, hype versus hope. And we're very fortunate to have Dr. Brian Balios here with us to help us try and figure out how to, you know, allocate our hype and hope and figure out what to get excited about and what to be cautious about. Dr. Balios has um, a PhD in stem cell biology and regenerative medicine from the University of Toronto. And he's currently working on completing his MD as part of the MD-PhD program. So we're so grateful that he took some time out of his very busy schedule to come and share with us his thoughts about hope and hype in stem cell research. Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Mary, and thanks to the organizers again for having me uh, come out here and talk to you about a, a topic which is uh, very uh, dear to my heart and important to me is uh, stem cell research and vision therapy, it's something I've spent uh, a lot of time over the last decade uh, working on. Uh, and I hope that the video introduction uh, gives you some indication of the new and exciting directions that uh, stem cell research and regenerative medicine is, is taking uh, in the eye. Now, the title of my talk is uh, Stem Cell Research, Hope Versus Hype, but I'd, I hope to be able to convince you uh, over the next hour, or sorry, the next 20 minutes, <laughs> I could go on for an hour, over the next 20 minutes, uh, that there's much more hope uh, than hype uh, in the field of stem cell research. And as Mary mentioned, I did my, uh, my PhD work with uh, Dr. Derek Vanderkoy at the University of Toronto. And during this time, I was exposed to much of the exciting progress uh, towards cures for blinding eye disease. And it was inspiring mentors like Dr. Vanderkoy and other scientists uh, that are being funded by the Foundation Fighting Blindness uh, that are searching for the next generation of treatments for vision loss that really propelled me into this field. Now, for the most part, as you saw in the video this, this afternoon, I'll be talking about uh, diseases that affect the light-sensitive tissue at the back of the eye, the retina. And the retina, as, uh, as we heard Dr. Devenier, if you were here for his, uh, his talk just before mine, is really the camera of the eye. This is the light-sensitive tissue that transforms light energy into the electrical signals that are transmitted to our brain and that allow us to uh, see form and color and vision in the world around us. And diseases of the retina and disorders can really take two types. So those disorders uh, that are classified as those that many patients are, are said to be born with or that are, that are inheritable or have a genetic component, like retinitis pigmentosa or Leber's congenital amaurosis, LCA, or diseases that may have a genetic component but strike later on in life, uh, those diseases like um, diabetic retinopathy, age-related macular degeneration, uh, but what all of these diseases have in common is that they result in uh, primarily irreversible damage to those cells uh, in, the back of the, in the back of the eye, in the retina. I'd just like to touch first on some of the current therapies uh, that are being uh, investigated to deal with these, uh, before I get to stem cell therapies, some of the current therapies that are being looked at to treat retinal diseases. And primarily those, uh, those therapies that are made to the clinic are pharmacotherapy, and what that really means are drugs drugs that can be used to stave off the progression of retinal disease. Now, now drugs and, and pharmacology may be able to prevent or to correct, uh, an under, may not be able to prevent or correct underlying genetic causes, uh, but can help to support the normal function uh, of these visual cells uh, before they degenerate. And they can also help to prevent many of the sequelae or the secondary effects of disease processes. And many of you may know in in wet age-related macular degeneration, for example, the growth of new capillaries, of new blood vessels under the retina uh, is, a, is a major factor in contributing to damage to the retina over time. And a, a drug like Lucentis uh, is an, basically an anti-blood vessel therapy. And the Foundation Fighting Blindness and, and other organizations are funding many of these uh, exciting avenues of research into new pharmacotherapy and new drugs, and you may hear heard about some of these in, in other sessions. And there are many other new drugs still in the animal uh, testing phase of research. The thing about drugs and pharmacotherapy is that while they may help to stave off the progression of disease, they're very unlikely to correct the underlying root cause, and which are often genetic or cellular uh, causes. And while they may serve 
as an important adjuvant therapy or an additional therapy uh, when combined uh, with other uh, vision restoring therapies, they're unlikely to be vision preserving or vision restoring or regenerative in and of themselves. One advantage of the uh, pharmacotherapy, however, is that the approval process for new drugs in this process uh, is, is often much more rapid than new cellular therapies or therapies like, like uh, retinal prostheses. Uh, the, the pharmacotherapies often do not make permanent changes to the retina, to the genotypes uh, or, the, or the cells in the retina, and they're often derivatives of other drugs that have been approved elsewhere in the body. So there's a strong regulatory framework, and as we'll see in a, in a second, as I'll describe, the, the stem cells are quite different in that way. But I'd like to mention and just briefly touch on two other approaches that are being looked at for, for retinal uh, diseases before I get to, uh, to stem cells. And we may have, uh, if you were here this morning, you may have heard Dr. Uh, Rod McInnes talk about uh, gene therapy. And as he mentioned in his talk, in the last 20 years, our understanding of the genetic underpinning of retinal disease has grown exponentially. And as he mentioned, there's over 200 uh, single genes that have been identified now to contribute to retinal disease. And I see this both as a challenge and an opportunity when coupled with stem cell therapy. The challenge is that this highlights the incredible heterogeneity or incredible diversity that exists in the different causes of human blindness. And it's going to require concerted efforts from multiple experts in the field and considerable funding from multiple agencies to help researchers understand how these genes, which we've been able to identify very well, actually contribute to the disease and how we might be able to interfere with those pathways. But it does offer us an incredible opportunity and that for the first time we're able to understand the molecular and cellular underpinnings of disease and that single gene therapy, single gene disorders may be amenable to, to gene therapy. And as we heard, gene therapy may take the form of replacing lost or damaged genes uh, with viruses to give uh, back the function of those genes uh, to remaining cells. It does, however, again, assume that the cells that are necessary to function in the normal function of the eye still exist and haven't degenerated over the course of the, of the disorder. And we heard about some of the early successes in gene therapy, uh, and many of you may be aware of the, the trials for RPE65, uh, gene replacement therapy in, in LCA, Leber's congenital amaurosis, and early results and encouraging results uh, from, from trials, especially in the UK, around that, that therapy. And there's a great deal of research going on across Canada uh, as well. But what do we do for people who have completely lost vision and where the cells that normally work to produce the visual image are destroyed? And we just heard about retinal prostheses uh, from Dr. Devenier. These are electronic devices, uh, which are in fact a digital camera that are linked directly to the visual pathways which were illustrated in, in the video that send information directly to the brain. And the Argus 2 device is one, is one prominent example of that that's been explored in recent years. Uh, Again, the, the images that are being formed from, from these devices are still, as we, as we saw in, in, uh, in the videos, uh, fairly rudimentary in that they give back black and white vision, and yet they don't allow the wearer to see the, the finer details. They're often large block text or large uh, objects, but it is a very important advance for those who, are, uh, who have almost no vision uh, at all and is giving a lot of encouraging uh, research and a lot of promise uh, to the sorts of therapies that we're also pursuing along the lines of stem cells. But the question I've been asking in, in my research is, is there a way to give back biologic sight to the retina? Is there a way to restore damaged tissue and to help the retina heal the way our skin would heal after an injury or a cut so that it can function again as, as nature intended it to originally during development? And this is really the goal of, of stem cells and cell therapy. Now, for those of you who, who've not been to a stem cell talk before, it's always important to start by explaining what is a stem cell and defining a stem cell. And the most important definition of a stem cell, I feel, is that it's a Canadian discovery. It was discovered by doctors Till and McCullough here in, uh, in Toronto in the, uh, in the late 60s and early 70s, and they characterized the cardinal properties of stem cells and showed their remarkable properties for being able to give rise to many different cell types in the body. And in, that, in the intervening time span since then, we've learned that there are many different types of stem cells. They come in many different flavors, and many of them you've probably heard about, embryonic stem cells, uh, also known as ES cells, adult stem cells, which 
populate many of the different tissues of our, of our adult bodies. And IPS cells, induced pluripotent stem cells, which uh, doctors John Gurdon and Shinya Yamanaka won a Nobel Prize for their discovery of these cells about two years ago. And with, without going into too much detail on, on the different types of cells beyond saying there's a, there's a number of different cell sources, there's really two strategies we've been looking at for using stem cells to treat vision therapy, uh, to treat vision loss in vision therapy. The first is endogenous stem cell stimulation. And this takes advantage of the adult stem cells that are present in all of our tissues. And in that particular strategy, we look to use factors to promote their proliferation or their division and their ability to change into the multiple cell types that make up the retina, for example. The idea in that particular strategy being that the retina can be encouraged to heal itself from the inside. But in the shorter term and the more immediate future, we're thinking about stem cell transplantation uh, to, to treat uh, retinal disease in the idea being there that we give back those cells which are lost or damaged in disease. In that particular strategy, we, we isolate the stem cells, we culture them in a dish, and we inject their progeny into the diseased tissue, in this case the retina, to replace those damaged cells. And this particular strategy has met with some translational success in recent years, particularly around the replacement of RPE cells. RPE cells are retinal pigment epithelial cells uh, that sit underneath the retina, and in that video, just underneath the photoreceptor layer, and their function is to support the survival and neutrify the, the photoreceptors and also to absorb light that enters the eye. And when these cells are lost, photoreceptors typically are lost and die secondary uh, to that degeneration. And in the last five to ten years, we found multiple stem cell sources for RPE cells, both from uh, autologous donor tissue as well as ES cells and IPS cells and adult stem cells. And much functional improvement has been seen in our preclinical animal models. Now, excitingly, in the U.S., a company called Advanced Cell Technologies has been working on phase one, two clinical trials with human embryonic stem cell derived RPE cells for two particular disease types, Stargardt's macular dystrophy and the dry form of age-related macular degeneration. And I'd like to share with you just a little bit of some of the recent uh, um, results of this trial. And the final results are not out, but they're beginning to publish and look at uh, intermediate time points for these, uh, for these trials. And they've looked at 18 patients with, that have been gone through at least six months of uh, a follow-up since their uh, implantation or transplantation, as you'd like to call it, with, with uh, RPE cells. And what they've seen is that in so far, and their final time points are going to be up to a year, but so these are early, uh, early time points, increased pigmentation in 13 of their 18 patients and increased visual acuity in 10 of those patients that are showing some improvement in visual acuity on the, on the letter-based uh, letter scale. What these trials, the goal of these trials, again, to show us uh, they're using very small numbers of RPE cells, but the goal of the trial is to show safety and any potential for efficacy, uh, early efficacy, with a small number of pigmented cells. And what it looks like is even in, in those patients which have not regained visual acuity yet, is that these cells are surviving and they're quite stable underneath the retina, are not proliferating beyond their potential, and are staying uh, quite stable in, in a, in a monolayer under the retina, exactly like normal RPE cells should do. In addition, there's a clinical trial that recently started in Japan where they're using IPS cells to make RPE and transplant those cells into patients. And the beauty of that particular trial is that with the IPS cell, this is a stem cell made from human skin. So you can take a patient's own skin in a biopsy, a small uh, punch biopsy out of, the, out of the patient's forearm, turn these skin cells into stem cells that can make any cell in the body, they're then transforming those stem cells into the RPE and putting them back into the eye. And those trials just started up this summer and we'll be interested to see and follow very, uh, with, with much interest what those, uh, what those will show in terms of safety and if and any efficacy. So we can see that already these stem cell therapies are beginning to make their way into a clinical setting. They're already beginning to navigate that fairly complicated regulatory landscape that's new for cell therapies, much different than big pharma as used before for, for, uh, for drugs. 
The goal in my research, however, has been replacing the photoreceptors directly. And this is really the only option to restore these cells after they're lost, because the retina cannot produce photoreceptors once they've, once they've died. It's not like skin, which can heal after a cut and produce new skin cells. And the RPE only supports the survival of these cells, but it won't create new photoreceptors. And again, with stem cells, there's multiple sources we could think of to get these photoreceptors. But what are the best stem cell sources for cell therapy? And I would argue that adult stem cells afford us the most flexibility and are probably the best sources for, for stem cell therapies to derive, to derive photoreceptors for a number of reasons. First of all, it avoids much of the ethical concern that's been raised in the past about using embryonic or fetal tissue or embryonic stem cells. It allows a, for us to, to do patient-specific harvesting and that we can take a small biopsy from a patient's eye, grow those cells out in the dish, and then transplant those back. And it also has, gives us the potential avenue to explore using that endogenous stem cell stimulation, like I mentioned before, allow, encouraging the eye to heal itself uh, from the inside. So the adult retinal stem cells, as, uh, as was shown in the video, exists in what's called the pigmented ciliary epithelium. And this is really that dark band around the outside of the iris. If you all look into each other's eyes, I like to do this, if you all look into each other's eyes, the person next to you, and see the colored part of the eye, that dark band just around the iris, one in 500 of those cells is a retinal stem cell. And these are the cells that help to build the retina when we grow in utero and when we're developing before we're born. And they now reside quiescently, quietly. They don't proliferate, and they stay quite stable there throughout our lives, well into our 80s and 90s. And Dr. Vanderkoy's lab discovered these cells in the early 2000s and characterized their incredible potential to turn into any type of cell in the adult retina. And what we've been working on in the last, uh, I say the last few years, especially in, in my work in the lab, has been harnessing that power uh, to make the specific cells we want, the rod and cone photoreceptors that are lost in, in retinal disease. And my work specifically has been focused on new ways to transplant uh, those cells into the retina. There's a number of challenges that are raised when you look to transplant a cell population into the retina. And the major hurdles include the differentiation of those cells, turning them into the cells we want, as well as keeping them well distributed and surviving and integrating as, we, as we'd like them to. And with the generous help of the Foundation Fighting Blindness uh, and others, we've, we've shown the potential uh, functional benefit of transplanting our cells into the eye and restoring visual function in mice. And we've isolated combinations of chemical factors that can transform our stem cells into photoreceptors with greater than 90% efficiency. So we're generating now very pure cultures of retinal stem cells. And we've combined our work with those working with biomaterials to deliver new, uh, develop new gels to deliver these cells. They keep the cells distributed, and they help them to integrate. And our mice are showing indications of improved visual function after transplantation. Previously blind, now able to see. And in the last, uh, so, and our research is also getting at understanding the very basic signals that tell our eye how to develop, and our retina, how to build the eye during development. Therapeutic goal be there being to generate ultra-pure populations for transplantation. I'd just like to end with, with just a, a minute mentioning the idea of hope versus hype. And there's many who would like to take advantage of the hope right now in stem cell therapy, and this really raises the danger of stem cell tourism. This is the idea of international sites and companies offering as yet unproven therapies. There's many reports of case reports of patients encountering harm from these therapies because of unknown formulations being injected into different sites of the body. An example being IV injections of stem cells to treat retinal disease. And we know there's no physical way for stem cells to leave the bloodstream to regenerate the retina. And what I'll say about that is I would very much encourage you to visit the International Society for Stem Cell Research website. That's an excellent resource, and it lists companies offering unproven stem cell therapies. And uh, this would be a, a, an excellent uh, place to go to look for, for what sorts of therapies are out there and are undergoing clinical trials right now and which ones yet have, uh, do not have strong evidence. So in conclusion, Canadian scientists like myself, like Dr. Vanderkoy, like, like others gathered here today are playing an important role in the international effort uh, to fund uh, and, and to explore uh, new, uh, new vision therapies, including stem cell therapies. And, I would this very much in thanks to, uh, to the Foundation Fighting Blindness.
I think today is an opportunity for you to learn more about stem cell research and, and research and vision in general. And I would encourage you to be bold in asking your questions. Scientists like myself, we really enjoy these events. We find inspiration in your journeys and we share your eagerness for answers. I, I thank you all for coming and I hope you find it a, a very informative and inspiring day. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for your uh, presentation. I had a question. You said that uh, they are using our cells for uh, repairing the area that is damaged. How we don't uh, involve with the uh, restarting the same problem in the future? If we get this disease before from ourselves, might it happen again? That's, a, that's an excellent question. So it raises a very, a very controversial point in, in the use of autologous or patient's own cells for treating retinal disease in that if it is a primarily a genetic uh, defect, how is that gene, uh, how is that, won't that be carried through to the, the eventual cells that you're looking to replace? And what we've been doing in that case is we've been combining the techniques of gene therapy to take the cells out to correct the genetic defect in the dish where it's much easier to interrogate and, and, and look at those specific cells and isolate a stable cell, a stem cell, that we've been able to correct the genetic mutation in and then look at transplanting those cells back. So that, that takes the idea of using autologous stem cells and spreads it out. We may have diseases that are more amenable sooner because we don't need to correct genetic defects because they're primarily not a genetic disorder. They're more environmental or related to retinal injury. And then it may take us longer to, to implement the techniques of gene therapy, combine it with stem cell therapy uh, to eventually treat, uh, treat those patients. So it, it, it means that there may be two cohorts or two phases of stem cell therapy in the future. Thank you. That's a great question. Thank you. Um, my question is, I'm going to give you just a short synopsis of my condition. I was, uh, I'm, I'm congenital uh, cataracts with... Um, high myopia. I was, uh, had a detached retina when I was 17 and lost that eye. Uh, and, and then had, had actually developed glaucoma, which then helped to tear the other one off. Do you see in the future, and probably long future, anything that could be done for a situation like that? And I've been blind now for um, about 35 years, but I, I still have light perception in one eye. Yes, I think uh, there's a number of, of uh, retinal conditions, including glaucoma, which may be amenable to stem cell therapy. But I, I, again, I would caution that right now a lot of this work has been focused on diseases of the outer retina, where we've lost the photoreceptors. And we've had a lot of success in our preclinical work in the laboratory in getting fission back in, in, in mice and rats and, and larger animals, particularly because those cells that we transplant only need to make that short connection in the retina to join up with the next cell in the chain. In the case of a, of a uh, condition like glaucoma, um, it, we need to encourage those cells to stretch their axons or their processes all the way from the retina back to the brain. And that, that gets into a lot of other challenges. So how do we encourage cells and, and guide them to, to, ma to make their little processes go all the way from the eye at the front uh, right to the very back of the, of the brain? That's a, that's a new challenge. It's going to require a combination of, uh, of, of talents and, and research insight from not only retinal specialists, but also uh, people who are looking at neuroscience in general in the brain. And it was drawing on a lot of techniques that we've learned from uh, regenerative medicine and spinal cord injury and, and other types of conditions where we need to encourage cells to grow very long processes. So I think that that's... We're looking at doing one hurdle at a time, getting cells to integrate and, and survive. And, uh, and distribute effectively. And I think that that, uh, while amenable to stem cell therapy, may be something further down the road than some, a condition like uh, retinitis pigmentosa or AMD, uh, conditions primarily of the outer retina. I uh, do understand that my question may be still theoretical at this stage, but uh, we've learned a lot today about gene therapy and uh, uh, stem, uh, stem cell uh, therapy. Is there any theoretical possibility one day both of them can be combined to the same eye? 
Yes, I, I think that that's, uh, that's a very distinct possibility. And certainly we've been looking at combining, uh, speaking more broadly, we've heard a lot about uh, different drug therapies as well today, gene therapies, drug therapies. I think there is a real place for combinatorial therapy in the eye. The eye is a, a nervous, uh, nervous uh, the retina at least is nervous tissue. It's, a, it's, a, uh, uh, it's derived from the central nervous system. It's the only central nervous system tissue we can see from the outside of the eye. It makes it very amenable to a lot of different techniques, including gene therapy, where we can see exactly where we're putting the viruses, cell transplantation therapy, where we're trying to inject cells to very specific locations, and drug therapy, uh, as we've had a lot of experience already with, with drugs like Lucentis. And so I think there is a lot of... Uh, I think there is a place for gene therapy in the future. Now, whether we deliver those genes to the cells while they're in the dish before we transplant them, or whether we deliver them afterwards to help these, to deliver factors in genes that help cells to, uh, to survive and function uh, optimally after transplantation, that remains to be seen. So where do we combine these therapies? At what point in the stem cell pipeline from derivation to transplantation? I think that, that remains to be seen where the optimum places, but I think there is, a, there is a place for gene therapy and drug therapy in, in combined with stem cells. Yeah, I think the autologous uh, uh, transplantation sounds very exciting, and like you said, kind of removes a lot of the, the ethical issues that uh, go around that. A question, and, and you may not be able to answer it uh, clearly, but with the animal models that you're using, when you say that the site is improved, of course, there's, you know, there's a huge spectrum of vision. What yeah. kind of results are you getting, and how are you able to you kind of quantify that? Sure. So it's, it's very difficult with, uh, with an animal, as you can imagine. You can't ask it to read lines on a, on a vision chart. <laughs> so we, we interrogate that, that function in two different ways. The first way is electrophysiologically. We look at the, the function of the retina and whether, the, whether light signals are coming from the outer retina, where we expect photoreceptors to go, to the inner retinal structures, and that's used, using electroretinography. If anyone in the room has had that done, you can, you can remember how they put a contact lens on the eye and measure electrical potential across the retina. Very similar technique is done with these mice. The advantages in mice is that we can, we can use very specific genetic models in muta mutant mice that have absolutely no visual functional baseline so that any signals we see must be due to our transplanted photoreceptor population. So one way is through electrophysio electrophysiology, looking at electrical signals. The second is behavioral. Uh, so while we can't ask mice to do very complex behavioral tasks, um, we can train mice uh, under high light conditions where they can see with their cones to navigate a simple water maze. So this is, they navigate between walls and the maze. Then these special mice, which are mutants, uh, when we dim the lights, they don't have functional rods, so they can't see under dim light conditions. So we train them under high light conditions. We dim the lights so that then they can't see and then we try to replace those functional rods. So in those mice that actually get our, our stem cell transplantation, the idea being we can see if then they can navigate the maze because they can actually see under those low light conditions. So there's little tricks we can do with the mice to, to test their behavior at the behavioral level, whether they're seeing meaningful images. So there are two types of ways that we're looking at it. So, so the results have been promising at the electrophysiologic level that we can generate photoreceptors that uh, have visual function on their own in the dish and retinas that seem to respond to light signals. And we can see that the pupils will dilate and constrict appropriately according to light flashes of varying light intensity after we transplant, not completely 100% regenerating that effect size with our st stem cell transplantation, but at least a 10 to 15% improvement with our, with our stem cell transplants. That's one transplantation of a fairly small number of stem cells. It doesn't preclude the option of repeated transplantation. And we're still working on our behavioral outcomes with these mice. It's a little more of a challenge to train them appropriately so we get, we get good, reliable outcomes from them. But thank you for your question. Hi there. Um, I was just wondering in your stem cell if you've had any rejection from any of the patients, uh, specifically the ones in the United States where you've had 18 or so patients. Have you had any issues with rejecting the stem cells? So, so far from those trials, they haven't seen any uh, acute evidence of rejection, and they haven't seen any changes in the way they've assessed the retinas to suggest that there's any inflammatory process or any acute rejection going on uh, after transplantation. Uh, again, the eye itself is a, it's an immunoprivileged site, or it's considered an immunoprivileged site in the sense that you have, uh, 
a um, the, the eye is walled off from the immune system and that cells that you put there are potentially protected in the way that they would be if you were giving an immunosuppressive therapy. As yet, they haven't seen any indication of, of cell rejection. Uh, they've seen varying levels of pigmentation after they've transplanted those RPE cells. Whether that variation is due to a change in immune response or a rejection, that, that's, that's unclear. Nothing at the, at the level that they've, uh, they've analyzed would suggest that it's been that way. Thank you. Thank you.